Let us breathe in together and out. As we pray to the God of abundant love, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, for you are our rock, our guide, our great redeemer. Amen. I'll be honest, the thought of being here preaching a sermon, actually somewhat looking forward to graduation, somewhat ready to go into ministry, wow, I never thought I'd be here. I came to YDS a terrified 22-year-old, having just moved out of Tarrant County, Texas for the first time, all in a pandemic to study something I had never studied before at an Ivy League school. Who was I to think I could do that? Even more so, who was I to ever think I could possibly get up in front of a group of people and have anything new, fresh, unique to say. In fact, I was so sure I couldn't do that for the longest time that I was terrified every time I did preach a sermon that it'd be so far out there that I'd be wrong and have completely missed the point of the text. I chose this text for today, this passage from the Epistle to the Romans, partly because it was the first text I ever preached on. One I recorded from my kitchen table of my undergrad apartment that was only shown online in May of 2020. While I think I'll be leaving this program an entirely different person with a whole new outlook on life, ministry grown in ways that I never could have imagined, this text is one of the constants. This text means the world to me. But trust me, this will be a completely different sermon than the one I preached in May of 2020. I also chose this passage because I had an interim senior pastor once tell me that she always starts and ends her time at a church with a sermon on love. And I realized that that's how I want to approach my spaces as well. And this is my perfect way to end my time here. I say all of this because sometimes we talk about God's love as if it's a been there, done that. But God's love isn't been there, done that. God's love is right here, right now. This text starts with these binaries, heights and depths, angels and demons, present and future, death and life. It makes sense. We humans, we like things to be neat and orderly. We like things to make sense where we can easily pick it up, investigate it, examine it, and then set it back down and walk away. I think even more so we academics, theologians, scholars, students of Yale, we really like things to be neat and orderly. We make to-do lists and then we remake them and we remake them. We got here because of our excellent organizational skills that allowed us to do the big majors to work the great jobs, to lead student clubs the best, all while keeping up with our readings and paper writings and assignments. Even those of us that like to pretend that we're messy and disorganized, that we are so far behind on everything that there's no way we'll manage, we're still doing fine. <laughs> we might exaggerate because the slightest sign of disorganization feels like the worst thing in the world. There's not room for gray area. There's organized and there's complete chaos. There's all in and there's all out. And we so often approach our theology this way. Do you know how many conversations I've had at a table in the second floor common room where we somehow got into a debate on the merits of baby baptism versus believer's baptism? Or if we should do communion weekly or monthly if hell exists or doesn't? And before we know it, we're putting ourselves and each other into these boxes. These boxes are so dangerous for so many reasons. These boxes limit our peers. They shut down dialogue. They make a people who think this and a people who think that. They close us off to seeing other sides. They shut down any attempt to create community. These boxes, they limit ourselves. The boxes I started with at YDS, they were comfortable, but they lacked depth 
a sense of urgency, a sense of accountability. It's in shedding these boxes that I was able to grow and change and see new things that even if my own thoughts didn't change, they were deepened. We might be doing this to ourselves because we're scared of what can be and what we can learn. It's easy to sit in our comfort zone. Not sure what's next, but it's our comfort zone, so it can't be that bad. As we allow the little voice in our head to take over and stop us from stepping out on our own. But arguably, most importantly, these boxes limit our perception of God. God can't be limited, so I'm not saying that. But how we imagine God, how we see God working in our lives, in our world, how we see God in one another, it's limited when we don't allow ourselves to see a God that is constantly changing and evolving and learning alongside each of us. But God, God doesn't care about the boxes that we try to make. Paul tells us in this passage that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither anything else in all of creation, anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. I want to add something to this, edit Paul a little bit. We already have the line, nor anything else in all creation, so I feel safe in doing this. But what if we didn't speak in binaries and instead in spectrums? To me, God lives in the in-between. It's not neither end and nowhere in between that we can be, that we can escape being loved by God, a love that doesn't change based on how we act or what we do or don't do, but a never ending, always growing, unimaginable love that we can't fully know. God doesn't protect us from just anything, so terrible things do happen, but God sustains us through everything. The bad news is there's nothing we can do to make God love us anymore. But the good news? The good news is that there's nothing we can do to make God love us any less either. That love is constant no matter what happens. God's love is with us through it all no matter how dark and twisty we get. God is always close to us, whether we choose to be close to God or not. God's love isn't been there, done that. God's love is right here, right now. So it's up to us to decide what we do with this love. Sometimes we do a better job at accepting it, at feeling it, at knowing it. But what do we do with it? We can lean in. We can accept and embrace God's love. We can see that this love is not just for me or for you, but for everyone and everything in all of creation. And just like there's nothing that we can do to make God love us anymore, and nothing we can do to make God love us any less, that is true for everything and everyone in all of creation. It's up to us to make sure that that love is felt and known. It's time we tear up the boxes we've made. We open ourselves up to dialogue. Dialogue where we can't let go, that we we can let go of the self-righteousness of being Yale academics. Dialogues where we can let go of our need to know and instead let in the humility of knowing that we do not fully know God. Instead, letting God guide our conversations to be vulnerable with our deepest beliefs, and to find and build mutual respect and compassion for the people we're talking with. There's a reason why we have these big circular tables in the second floor common room. You can't just sit there alone. Someone is going to come and sit with you. There's a reason why to get from the south side of the building to the north side, you have to walk through the narrow hallways by the library and the big staircase. The reason There's a reason why we are forced to talk here. To me, God doesn't live in a sanctuary or in a building. God lives in the dialogue, in the discussion, in the willingness to find newer and deeper understanding. We've only made it this far through God, and we'll only end up where we end up next through God. That is how we build community. That is how we share the love of God that nothing in all of creation can separate us from.
May it be so.